I just want to just hold that for a moment. I feel like the word of the Lord's here this morning. Dorothy's just got something she wants to share. But if you've got a word, I just feel like there's a bubbling in the spirit realm. Come on, Dorothy, come up. And um, if you've just got something, it might be just one word, but I feel like the word of the Lord is here this morning. I, I just want to share um, an experience I had on Thursday evening, six o'clock. Um, I just went to close my bedroom blinds and I was absolutely stopped in my tracks by what was going on in the heavens. I don't know if anyone else saw it. Did anyone else see it? Oh, it was the most amazing thing. Um, if I can describe it briefly, I was stood transfixed for 15 minutes watching it. It was a movement. It was the whole sky was moving. And um, I don't know if I can do it without waving my arms around. Um, there, it was, it was like I was standing in the middle of um, not a storm. It wasn't a storm. It was just a movement that the clouds were going over me. They were going around, they were going around both sides. There was a whole bank of cloud, white fluffy clouds rolling and moving at the same time. And right in the middle was the blackest cloud I've ever seen. Ever seen. Did you see it? It was amazing. It was absolutely charcoal black. And then on top of that were white fluffy clouds all moving, all moving, and underneath it I saw the sunset. There was a strip of bright blue and brilliant red and that, you know, that what I call godlike, a gold light underneath it all. And it was just an amazing experience. And to be honest with you, I was looking for Jesus because I thought it's either Jesus has returned or my chariot's on its way. <laughs> anyway, as, as we've been worshipping this morning, the, the Lord has just been showing me um, and it just all ties in with what you've been doing, you know. It's like he's saying to me, you just behold my splendor and you will stand in the midst of the storm and it will go all around you. And can I tell you that the storm didn't come. The storm, I know there was a storm, but I heard no. I've spoken to people about it and they've said, yeah, they heard the thunder, saw the lightning and I didn't see any of that. The storm bypassed me completely. I didn't see anything or hear anything. But for 15 minutes, I saw the glory of the Lord standing in the midst of the storm. And I feel that that's what his word is to us today. He will keep us. When we keep our eyes on him, he will keep us in the eye of the storm and it will pass around us. Amen. Yes, Jeff. Um, up the back there, I'm not in the habit of doing this, but I had a vision. And it was very strong and very powerful. And what I saw was clouds were looming, they were everywhere, they were coming up. And in the midst of this wind was a Lord riding on the wind, like a war horse, riding on this wind, like a war horse that's courageous and powerful. And he was coming back. And I saw him and his weapon that he brought with him was a two-edged sword with his tongue, able to cleave body from spirit. And that was my vision. That was. I've, I've known Jeff for how many years? Jeff, probably five years, and he's never had a vision before that I've known about, so praise the Lord. Good on you, mate. Hey man, has anyone else just got something they feel like the Lord's just dropped into your heart? I'm thinking Faye. I keep feeling like she's got to share something. Oh, I saw a couple of things that I just want to share. During worship, I saw a vision of us um, like Niagara Falls, and we're standing behind Niagara Falls. Um, you know, you got the water flowing down, but we were in, like, in the rock. God, we even sang about that, but had us in the rock. And I saw the, the flow of the water and you could hear the roar of the water. And the Lord is saying that he is isolating us to be with him. Just him and us, just one, one on one. And you could hear the roar of everything going around you. You could hear the roar of the enemy and everything that the enemy is doing. 
but it can't touch you, it can't come near you. Just like you're standing under that waterfall, um, you know, you might feel a little bit of the mist, in which I feel that's what we're feeling now, just a little bit of the mist, but you won't get that full, full um, force of the water or the full force of what the enemy's got planned for you because God has protected you in that place and he's isolating you. To be with him, it's a one-on-one. -on -one. I'm getting, it's a relationship he's building between one-on-one -on -one. Um, and he's isolating each of us in our hearts individually and as a church. And the second vision I saw was, um, was like a blacksmith. Um, I, was, I kept thinking of the days of old when they um, didn't have any weapons or anything and they went, the blacksmith, I kept seeing like, is it the An Anvil? Okay, that's the name that came to me. I'm not very good at all this stuff. <laughs> um, I saw the Anvil and I saw, I saw him like making um, a sword or something and I saw it was red hot and I saw him hammering and he's making a weapon and God has isolated you also into that place that is making you a weapon in his hand. He's got you in his hands and he's um, got you on the anvil and you might feel a little bit of something every now and then <laughs> that he's made it's like you're red hot but he's, he's forming you and he's making you into this this incredible weapon that he's going to send forth at the right time in his hands as his hands going to send forth that weapon and uh, because he's making it He's creating it. It's not that something that we've created ourselves. He's doing it. And it's going to be powerful. Okay. It's interesting about clouds. Oh, just really, that really spoke to me. Because yesterday I went down the beach and I felt the Lord say, take pen and paper. And, and I did. And what I felt in the spirit was saying, you will see profound things in the spirit. Capture them in your heart pray without ceasing until that cloud on the horizon breaks forth there's something about us looking at the atmosphere and seeing god move in the atmosphere so we need to watch for that cloud on the horizon to break forth and many will see me moving for my heart is moved and i do hear the cry of my children so look watch capture and step out and even what Faye was just saying then about you know the work of god in us and us virtually being God's weapon so to speak and I just feel like everything this morning Holy Spirit is just bringing that together but he is speaking some profound things and we're going to be watching and looking for them in Jesus thank you yes Sheila come. It's, it's more it's like being for the last two weeks Lord's been showing me all these clouds and I see him in his glory. I see that he's coming soon. And I've been watching the clouds and looking at them. And then I think it was Tuesday night or Wednesday, there was a, a huge, um, forget the word, like a hurricane, but they call it something else in Japan. In Japan, over Osaka and the Northern Islands. And I saw, I saw the actual, in real life, on the TV, the, a huge big hurricane cloud, whatever it's called, over, over Japan, and it actually looked like a big, huge, horrible monster demon. And I felt like the Lord say, the battle, the battle in, in the world is so strong to, to, to get hold of nations and stop the gospel and to just believe and pray for the opening of the the, the, the sky over these lands to pray for the glory of the Lord to open up the darkness in um, other nations as well as here. It was, it was so real. I, I woke up next morning and I just start uh, pray, Lord, um, the, the enemy is trying to annihilate whole countries, but we have, we have got weapons and he's over it all and he, it's his time for us to pray and open nations in prayer. Typhoon, that's it. Amen. We're just going to pray. I'm going to invite Steve wants to share a word of knowledge, but I just want to pray right now. Father, we just, we acknowledge you in the midst this morning. We thank you, Father God, where you said where two or three are gathered, there am I. And Lord, we thank you for that. 
We thank you for the collective word of the Lord in this house this morning. We thank you for all these natural phenomena that we're seeing. And Lord, whilst we don't rate them above scripture, we do know, Lord, that you speak to us through, through, the, through nature itself. And Lord, we thank you this morning that you are so faithful. And Lord, we bless you for the things you're doing. And we ask, Lord, come, Lord Jesus, come in our midst. Come and do abundantly more than we can ask or even imagine. I ask that today. Amen. Come on. Yeah, the word was battle weary. So those that are bat have in the battle, but you're weary. Um, so you're just feeling a bit tired and battle weary is the word. So what I felt then was, you know, stand and see the salvation of our God. When Moses uh, stood for the Red Sea, I just felt the battle you've been having, there's a Red Sea to walk through. But the key is to share with others and have them lift your hands up as Moses interceded. And so just to encourage you during the communion time, if you feel you're battle weary and you've been trying to fight the battle on, on your own, then allow others to come and lift your hands up and then receive the salvation of your God. I believe it's a Red Sea parting experience for those that step out during communion time. Amen. And we're going to move into communion right now. You know, this is a time of victory. We do this each week because it represents the victory that was already won for us on Calvary. And as Jesus died, the Bible says he overcame, he defanged the enemy. And this morning, if you're in, in a battle, you're in some sort of fight that you're struggling with, I want to encourage you as you take the emblems today, take the cup, take the bread. This is your victory. This is your power over the works of all the works of darkness. And so I want to encourage you to go. There's a table at the back, two at the front. Maybe go to a different table than you went to last week. Try to mix it up. But let's all stand together and let's go and make our way to a table and let's fight the battle of the Lord this morning as we take communion together. Amen. Jesus, we just want to um, you know, just thank you, Lord, for such a great time of breakthrough and worship, Lord. And we just thank you, Lord, that you're so sensitive to us and our needs. And uh, Lord, we just love you, that you're such a personal God. And Father, we just, um, just want to welcome Inter and Jeff back too, especially after their, um, their very tragic death of their son. And um, yeah, we just um, ask for the God of all comfort just to keep surrounding them as they go through this season, Lord. We thank you that they belong to a body who loves them, God, that they are loved. And um, we just thank you, Lord, for that love that heals the broken heart, Lord God. We just thank you, Lord, for healing broken hearts, Lord, for their whole family, Lord. For I pray for their grandchildren, Lord, and the extended family, Lord, that they'll come to know you as Lord and Saviour, Lord, those that don't already know you, Lord, that um, you will turn for good, Lord, what the enemy's meant for bad, Lord, you'll turn for good, in Jesus' name. And <clears throat> we just want to um, mention a couple of things that are happening in our month. At first, we're um, just reminded about, you know, really pressing in for the supernatural, that this is the month that we're expecting to see miracles. You know, we're seeing signs in the sky, we're, we're seeing things, aren't we? And um, just that we're declaring our um, victory in the Lord and even the other day at work I was just felt like the morning it's not going well I felt like there's demonic interference and then I just felt God showing me a couple of things and and then I thought right call on the angels so I did I said Lord I need some help here because we've got access to this help but we do we have to remember to call on that and I just saw the afternoon turn around and so I just want to remind you that we have access to this because we're, we're part of his kingdom and his kingdom has, has angels and archangels and so not to be afraid to ask because he says, ask and you shall receive, knock 
and the door shall be opened unto you. So um, we're just celebrating today, Rosh Hashashana, I can't even say it. But, um, you know, it, I looked that up and it was just talking about, um, as well as it being, you know, and the new year for um, Hebrew, it's also a day, of, it's celebration, the birthday of the universe. I love that. <laughs> Adam and Eve, you know, it's really exciting. And uh, so we want you to join. Sue's going to give us a great message on that after. Um, but if you can stay, we'd love you to all stay and celebrate that with us through a meal fellowship. Um, afterwards, just in our back room here. Uh, we have a special prayer and intercession for the deep calls, um, deep calls <laughs> at the sanctuary. And that's going to be Sunday the 16th at 4 p.m., 4 to 6. I really encourage you to get along there and we seek the face of the Lord and uh, we know that he's so eminent. And um, yes, we've also got the conference coming up, you know about. Um, we've got also Darren Cunning, the outpouring. This is Friday night, 21st of September, the sanctuary, and the 22nd, the sun Saturday night and the Sunday morning. So Get a fly if you haven't already and invite your friends. It's going to be a great, great um, weekend. And also Steve's asked me to announce about Awaken Frankston. It's coming and we're praying for the love, intimacy and awakening in Frankston. There's so much prayer being already sown, hasn't there? Loads and loads of seeds have been poured into Frankston and we're looking forward to that harvest. So that's on Friday the 28th of September. It's the grand final eve, so it's the Friday, the public holiday, between 6 and 9 p.m. There will be some brochures next week. Um, yeah. Yeah, okay. So, Leap of Faith, we're talking about <laughs> stepping in. This is a little bit of a different, it's comedy. I don't know if any of you have seen that movie, saw the movie with Steve Martin. Steve Martin a while back, but Gateway are putting on the presentation and Steve and... Peter are going to be in that. So if anyone would like to come, I'm interested in going. Also, a guy that I work with is also in it. So if anyone wants to come, it's going from 15th of September to the 23rd. So I was thinking maybe on the Sunday afternoon, if anyone wants to come, just come and see me and we can book tickets. It's $25 for a pension or pensioner or um, $35. Now, I'd like to take up our tithes and offerings. So, um, yeah, if we can have a song... And I uh, just wanted to mention, um, yeah, just that it is a day to expect miracles <laughs> and provision. And Hebrews 10:39 says, "But we do not belong to those who shrink back and are destroyed, but to those who have faith and are saved." So just as we give our tithes and offerings, just see it in a fresh light. May, Lord, you give us fresh eyes to see, to see through this, in a, as, uh, through the eyes of faith that he is the door. You know, Jesus is the door. And as we give, we're actually opening up a door for provision to come in, for, for all sorts of provision, not just financial, but um, salvation, you know. Salvation for our loved ones is just we're obedient. The Lord blesses us. You know, he can give us a word of knowledge for a friend or a workmate. You know, that's all provision, providing for his vision. But we are co-heirs, aren't we, with his vision to see the lost come in, to see our world saved, you know, to see Frankston come on fire. So all this is just as we give, we shall receive. So if you'd like to um, give into the offering now. So um, it was great hearing all the prophetic words. Isn't it amazing how God... Um, just is the same Holy Spirit in all of us. <laughs> so um, I'm amazed by that sometimes because I always think I'm better than you guys. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, I don't know. <laughs> so no, that's what you all guys think too. You know, you think oh, I've got a word. It's true, but you know, it's the same Holy Spirit. I'm being sarcastic. I'm sorry, but um, yeah, I just thought I'd add that in. Um, and it's so so interesting this season, you know, I was overseas and I began to begin to ponder about God, what, you know, what God wanted to share and the fact that we're entering in September and I was, I was in overseas in August. And then I began to see that today at sundown is the start of the new year, Jewish New Year. And so I found that really interesting because I felt that the Holy Spirit was really starting to just brood and 
give me uh, just some thoughts, you know. And uh, I, I think sometimes what happens to us is like what was given this morning, you know, stand and see the salvation of our God. You know, that scripture, our ways are not his ways. His thoughts are better than, you know, higher than our thoughts. And we quote them and quote them. And, and, and sometimes you think, oh, my goodness, God, I don't know, you know. <laughs> you stand and see the salvation. You can stand for 10 years. And you're waiting and wondering, what is, what's going on, you know. And so um, I started to ponder about that, you know, because I, don't you guys ask questions like that? I do. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with give, giving the prophetic word. I'm, I'm all for that. I believe in the promises of God. But sometimes it's that faith step and that, and you think, oh, God, I'm, I'm just like, like uh, Steve said this morning, you know, some of us just get incredibly weary. You know, how many times have I got to say, you know, you, you talk to God and he goes, trust, like Mark says, he's, he says, trust me. Or stand and see the salvation. I'm like going, where? You know, you go like that. But today I want to share um, some things that have probably been already shared through even the prophetic word, which is really significant because I think then God's just reaffirming some stuff. And I want to share things probably in two parts, but they're actually interwoven. And I think probably going to talk a little bit about the new year and not that I know a lot about, um, you know, the Jewish uh, language or even, you know, the celebration during this time. But I believe it really hooks into our next season as a body of believers. And so you'll find that I'm going to intertwine those two. And it might seem a little bit higgledy-piggledy, but I'm doing that just because I feel that the two are linked so inseparably. And I think as we cross over to this new year, I don't know if... Did everyone know that it's the beginning of the new year, the Jewish new year? I think it's more significant than us in the Gregorian calendar, you know. And it's actually the year 5779 we're about to move into this year and so with any new year we look forward and we leave behind the old past you know the past we press on to the things that are ahead and it's like the cycle of life occurs um, the ending of one season entering into the next season and always it ushers in new beginnings you know it's that through that cycle of change and the number nine this year holds a great significant uh, it's great significant significance that's really good isn't it is how these two these cycles occur since it's the number nine that last number five seven seven nine next year it turns over to 80 you know it'll be five eight eight oh no no seven eight oh that's right thank you i think i'll leave now <laughs> so number nine is the largest and the last digit of the single digit numerical system the number nine holds the earmarks of finality completeness judgment as, and it's a prophetic marker for the new year. The biblical meaning of the number nine is also related to the nine fruits of the Holy Spirit, the nine gifts of the Spirit, the ninth hour of a prayer, and the ninth letter in the Hebrew, Hebrew alphabet called Tet. The Hebrew letter, Tet, is a, has a paradox, paradoxical meaning of both good and evil, purity and impurity. And the Hebrew pic, pictograph of the letter Tet looks like a snake coiled inside a basket. And I think we might have a picture. I don't know if we got... And on the other hand, it resembles a woman pregnant with a child, indicating inner goodness, fruitfulness, and a time of physical birthing, spiritual birthing. So you can see that both the tet, but one side, it has this paradox, says this evil side in the sense of snake in the grass or the snake in the basket. But if you look at the other side, it's a man bowed in submission or a, a crowned man with a sword, a, a sword and but also it represents a womb. Can you see that? So there's two sides to it. And that's the paradox of, of this year in a sense. So last year we saw this cutting away and there's process at times where we've proven to be difficult and painful. So we've gone through times even indi individually or collectively where it's been difficult and painful, but it's necessary to, for the cutting away to bring forth that new fruit into this new season. He prunes those he loves. Every branch that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. So he prunes us so that we would bear more fruit. And then he goes, you know, in Jeremiah, it talks about plans to prosper you, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for welfare and not evil, to, di to give you our future and a hope. And sometimes that can be very hard to hold on to. When everything around you seems so bleak and black, how can you hold on to something that God's saying, you know, you've got a future and you hope and you go, oh my goodness, where's that future and that hope? 
But God has actually put us through a refining fire to cultivate our hearts of purity and sincerity, sincerity, exposing the hidden agendas of our heart. And in fact, without a shaking, they can, it's only with the shaking that the glory begins to rise. I'm going to take, talk more about this in a minute. He's getting us ready to move into a new season, to walk in and pioneer the prophetic mandate on our church. Yes, there's been a stripping away, but now is the time to birth, to take up the tools of war and faith and awaken the prophetic call within. This morning we have a choice this year to see this year as either the snake in the grass, in other words, to see the enemy in the grass and the snake, and that can be negative and positive, again, that paradox. But we have also the choice to say this year is about the birthing. It's about the womb in the sense that we're going to birth something that God has put on us as a destiny you know, a mandate upon this church that we will begin to birth it, we begin to walk into it. We've had nine months in the incubator and now it's time to birth. And I want to uh, just encourage you this morning, where is your focus this year? Look at your focus and say, is my focus to look, look at the snake in the gla- gra- grass or is my focus to look at the birthing about what God wants to do? Now, I'm a naturally negative person. You wouldn't believe that, would you? <laughs> So I naturally always tend on the negative side. So I'd rather look at the snake than I would at the birthing. But I encourage you, as I'm encouraging myself, that now is the season to see the birthing. Now is the time to believe that that birthing comes about. And as uh, um, Jen mentioned earlier, this time is considered with the birth of creation, where you know God hovered over and creative things began to happen. So God hovered over the darkness of the earth and what happened? Creativity came forth. Something was created. And it's the same time they believe that Sarah conceived Isaac and that Hannah had Saul, Samuel, sorry. You know, at that same time, on this day, God created Adam and Eve. So even today, we're going to blow the chauffeur. It's like the breath of God breathing into Adam and Eve, you know, at that time. So it's this time of real birthing this new year. That's what they're believing it's to see. It's to experience the breakthrough and to take back what the enemy has stolen off off us. He's tried to kill, destroy, discourage, do everything, strip, whatever. But now is the time to say, God, we are ready to be birthed and to take back what the enemy's stolen and to a breakthrough. And uh, Someone mentioned earlier today, you know, if you read the book of Exodus, what is there's a great story where Moses is sitting, you know, he's standing there holding up his arms. And I think Aaron and Hur are on either side. And as, as the battle's raging with Joshua down in the valley, and, you know, as his hands get weak, you know, the battle get, is losing. And when they lift his hands up, and so they stand there and hold his hands up so that they, they will, Joshua will win. And they actually win because they have on either side her and and Aaron are actually holding those hands up and today I I really believe that's that sense that we need to enter that place of intercession where we come against the spirit of delay and say it's now it's time to cross over just like in Joshua you know and that represent when I said about Moses it represented that sense of intercession in other words that we hold each other's hands up when they're weary and say God we want to win this battle we're tired of, we, we come against that spirit of delay that's stopping the birthing from happening in this place. And it says in Joshua 3, cha- uh, chapter 3, verse 17, Now the priest bearing the ark of the covenant of the Lord stood firmly on the dry ground in the midst of the Jordan, and all Israel was passing over the dry ground until all the nation finished passing over the Jordan. And this morning, we've been on dry ground. We've been in a barren place, and it's time to walk over, to cross over that barren land onto the other side, into the promised land of what God has for us, out of barrenness into birth. And I want to share with you, you know, the story out of uh, 1 Samuel. Can you guess where I'm going to go? And, it, and it's about Hannah. And in First cha- uh, Samuel chapter 1, verses 1 to 2, it says there was a certain man from the hill country of Ephraim whose name was Akana, son of Jothrabim, and son of Elu, the son of Tahu, the son of Zephu, and an Ephronite. He had two wives. Wasn't he a very fortunate man? One was called Hannah and the other Penai. Penai had children, but Hannah had none. And Penai was one of the wives of Elkanah, along with Hannah. Penai had children, but Hannah was barren. 
You know what it says in Scripture? Because the Lord had closed her womb, she was barren. But Elkanah loved Hannah so much that when he visited Shiloh each year to offer worship and sacrifices to the Lord, he gave Hannah a double portion of the peace offering while only supplying Pina her due measure. He was a meanie, wasn't he? <laughs> and there was a dynamic that existed between these two wives. And so Pina used to uh, frustrate her and, and, and give strife to Hannah and say horrible things to her because of the, the barrenness, and, and it used to make Hannah bitter as well, the bitter waters of the barrenness, you know. But uh, Pen I would be there just sort of going, provoking her and grieving her in her spirit and because she had an inability to conceive a child. And so she would just have a go at her. And, you know, sometimes in our barrenness, people have a go at us. And they say, you should be doing this, you should be doing that, you go over there, you go, you know, just do this, do this. And, and you get discouraged because you think, oh my goodness, you know, look at all the life over there, look at all the fruit, look at, you know, they're birthing all these new things and here I am in this barrenness. And that's where Hannah was. People were, you know, Penai was ridiculing her and saying, you know, you, you're not, you've got no children, you're going to be barren for the rest of your life, you know, something like that. You can't, thank you, uh, you can't conceive any children, you know. And ha what did Hannah do? And so she, she, she obviously it affected her because words affect us, yeah? So Penai was speaking these negative words and Hannah, Hannah was still barren, you know, but she still cried out to the Lord and poured out her heart, even with the torment and the mistreatment of her, the other wife. The Lord showed favour to Hannah by opening up her womb. And the next morning, it actually says this in verse 19, 20, um, Elkanah and Hannah got up early to bow and worship before the Lord and then he returned to his home and Elkanah had Elkanai had relations with his wife Hannah and the Lord remembered her so in the course of time Hannah conceived and gave birth to a son and she named him Samuel saying because I have asked for him from the Lord so it was like the words of Penai attempted to steal and destroy and rob Hannah's dreams and and all the desires that Hannah had and another word we could say it was like Penai wanted to inflict an abortive spirit over Hannah you know and you know what the enemy what he likes to do is what steal kill and destroy and he usually looks for our weakest link to go and so if you're like me and a negative person often he'll go for that that link in our emotions it, normally it is in your emotions if you, you struggle with fear he'll go for the fear if you struggle with negativity or depression he'll go for that you know and what he does is then try to abort your destiny, your call. And what he tries to even do in churches is abort the call upon the church. So you can have all these prophetic words. You can stack them away in a little folder. But there's a time where you have to not just pull them out, but realize that sometimes the enemy comes with words himself and tries to abort and delay the call upon your life and upon the life of this community of believers. And I want to challenge you this morning that what we are doing in the spirit by praying and interceding we're actually saying lord even though we may appear barren there is through our prayer that we are stirring up that sense of fruitfulness and that we're ready to be birthed lord for no, it's more than nine months it's been two years we've been in the wilderness in the barrenness and we want to cross over to the other side into the fruitfulness we want to see that birthing take place there's actually even another reference in Acts, if you remember the story, uh, Acts 16, where Paul and Silas, you know, they were going to a place of prayer and a slave girl met them and she had a spirit of divination um, and she brought her own as much gain by fortune telling. She followed Paul and she cried out, these are men are servants of the most high God. We proclaim to you the way of salvation. And she kept going and doing this for many days. Imagine that, someone just following you around for many days. And in fact, we have that happen, but we might not physically have a person that follows us every day, but we have the words of the enemy in our ear following us every day. And Paul actually got annoyed. It's good to get annoyed. Paul got annoyed and he turned and said to the Spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of you. And it came out. The, that very hour the words of that wife to Hannah tried to intercept and break Hannah from believing and birthing the prophetic word in the sense of Samuel coming forth but God intervened because he heard her cry 
and he sent his hand and in a sense, you know, that birth of Samuel, that was a turning point in the destiny of Israel. You see, she was, Penai was used by the enemy as a source of grief and pain to, to weary Hannah, Hannah, Hannah out. It's, isn't it Penai and Hannah? Hannah out and wear her out to, so that she would lose all her hope for the future. And that oppressive spirit tried to distract and interfere the plans and purposes of God. And this morning it's the same way the enemy works the same way. It says the enemy schemes. Be aware of his schemes. In other words, his schemes means that he plans, he studies, and he looks for the best way to suffocate you. I know he does it to me. He looks for the best way. He says, hmm, hmm, which is the best way? But the Lord opened, can open things up. He can set, pe set us free. He can set us on a new path. He can cause us to cross over. And the more that we cry out to him, the more that we intercede and say, no longer are we barren, but we are fr fruitful. And you see what happens when delay comes, we try and put, take things in our own hands, just like the Israelites did, you know, with a golden calf. Um, and, and what they did was try to take everything in, because Moses had gone away, you know, he was up there, and they thought he's having a glory time, he's left us down here. So that, let's take matters in our own hands. And you know, if you read your Bible, you know the results of what happened at that point when we take things in our own hands. And so today, you know, we could take things in our own hands and say, let's go and do this, let's go and do that. But I think it's more important that we rest in God and say, God, what are you saying for this time? How do you need us to participate? We need to pray and intercede and keep, I want to keep encouraging you to keep doing that. Um, and there'll be a point where God will bring forth the birthing. Um, it actually says in Isaiah 66, shall I bring it to the moment, the birth and not cause to bring it forth. In other words, if you look at it, God has had us in this incubator, into this womb, in this place of barrenness. But he's actually saying, even though that barrenness is there, I'm going to bring forth, I'm going to conceive and bring forth a, a birth, a baby. And it's just because you go through one thing, you're going to go through the next. Do you know what I'm saying? So if you're nine months pregnant, you expect a baby to come out at some point. So he's actually saying, Isaiah, I cause it to come about. I will bring it forth. Even though I have shut the womb and made it barren, there is reasons, like someone even said this morning, there's a stripping away and there's a reason for that. God looks at the heart, at the agenda of the heart, and he's saying, but now it's time, that, that purifying, that stripping away, and now it's time to birth. Let's no longer be barren. As we enter into this new, new year, um, it's going to be a time, I really believe, to birth what God has placed uh, on this community of believers to see it come about where the enemy has tried to discourage and distract and tried to wear us out there's, it's going to be a time where he's going to bring forth a birthing we're going to be in lockstep with God coming in agreement with the prophetic promises that are in the womb of, of what God wants for us in the womb of that mandate and it's time to call forth intercessors and prayer warriors that have the heart like Hannah to contend for what the eye can't see but what the spirit reveals through faithful, unrelenting prayers, to prophesy life and fruitfulness into the womb of those prophetic promises and the dry bones to be revived, to release our sound and establish the land of our promise, our inheritance. It's time to say, God, I'm going to pick up the tools, I'm going to pick up the weapons, and I'm going to walk across the dry land into that fruitfulness, into the promises that you have, not just for me individually, but what you have for us as a corporate believe you know believers that the seeds will come to life and it's god's spirit hovers over us you know this morning you know we had that praise but you know when the spirit of come spirit of god comes in that really gentle kabod spirit it's like he's hovering why do you think he's hovering because he wants to give birth to something he begins to hover he begins to brood because he's reproducing and he's saying an act of creativity is about to come forth and about to release that the birthing is about to come. You've been in this womb, in this incubator, in this time of barrenness. You see, when, when a woman's pregnant, you don't know what the baby looks like unless you have a scan. So it's hidden away. The only thing you see is this thing coming out here, this big, big thing. Yeah, that's right. But you don't know what that baby's really going to be like. And that's the joy of that experience. But it's like he's had us hidden away inside that womb. Like... In that, in that sense, and you might say, yeah, there's growth happening, but I can't really see or perceive it. 
but God is saying the time is now to enter into this new season, to move from incubation to birth to breakthrough, and actually to say, what is in my hands? What are the most powerful weapons I have in my hands? And you might, have anyone an idea what's the most powerful weapon you have in your hand? Word of God, worship, prayer. It's a letting go, it's a picking up, it's time to occupy and establish. It's a time to circle around Jericho and create a prayer storm. You know, some of you have actually seen that, that sense of whirlwind. You know, how does a whirlwind, it's created, think of it as a prayer storm. So we're circling around Jericho, our Jericho, the walls, and we're circling around. So the old ways don't open up new doors. And as we move forward, God's going to open us to new realms and new dimensions and to see the supernatural and the miraculous as well. It's time to believe again, guys. I'm even talking to myself because it's harder. It's easier to walk, to be barren. It's harder to believe in the fruitfulness. I want to share with you uh, out of Isaiah 35, but again, just want to challenge you with those pictures. You know, there's more to it than that. And just for time's sake, I'm just going to keep pushing through. But, you know, for me... It's about that womb and that container and what God's going to release. It's not about the snake in the grass. And Isaiah 35 says this, The wilderness and the dry land shall be glad. Okay, the desert shall rejoice and blossom like the cockroach. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given to it, the majesty of Carmel and Sharon. They shall see the glory of the Lord, the majesty of God. Strengthen the weak hands and make firm the feeble knees. Say to those who have an anxious heart, be strong and fear not. Behold your God who will come with a vengeance. He will recompense. He's a God of recompense and he will come and save you. The eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap like a deer and the tongue of the mute sing for joy. For waters break forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. The burning sand shall become a pool and the thirsty ground springs of water. And I'll just leave it there. It actually goes on and it says in verse 8, A highway shall be there and it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass of it, over it. It shall belong to those who work, walk on the way. And there's just so much there. In Isaiah 40, it actually says, In the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway of God. Every valley shall be lifted up. Every mountain shall be made low. And there's just more to it. The glory of the Lord shall be revealed. And all flesh shall see it together. And one of the things, you know, I really believe at this time, this new season, uh, you know, today, the new year that we start to cross over into birthing, that we will see the birth happen that we'll no longer be in the incubator, no longer in the wilderness, that we begin to walk over and cross over the dry land into fruitfulness. And, you know, one of the things that I kept to ponder on is that we're a movement made of garments. And that's what one of the prophetic words that had come over this house. And I've always, you know, sat there and brooded over it and said, what, God, what are you saying? And you see, a movement can't happen unless you, you know, a movement is about letting go and not gathering into yourself. And you, God can't do a new thing while you're still living within your capacity. The power of God always operates in the margins of life. A movement shares a common cause. And in a sense, it's in that barrenness and that you know, um, wilderness that discontent is born. But it's in that discontent that vision and action take a birth as well. Discontent unfreezes people from you. It freezes us from our commitment to the way things are. And what I'm saying to you, in this group here, you've been committed to prayer and there's that sense of disconnect, discontent as well, which stirs you up and say, God, we so desire your creative release here, your revelatory creative release. We will do anything. See, movements emerge when people say something needs to change. And it's when you're in that place of discontentness that you begin to say, God, I want to see change. I want to see the miracles that you've promised. I want to see the future unfold. You know, that birthing, those prophetic words upon our lives individually, but also collectively. It's movements that change the world. In here, you might look at yourself, feel really worn down, but I tell you in here, there are people that will change the world. And you might say, well, well I can't go and do this and this, but it's through your prayers that the world has changed. It's that expansion into the presence of God that he will open up, you know, visions and encounters with him. 
Um, it's one of the key ways, movements, one of the key ways that God brings a renewal and expansion to his church. It's because you're in a place of discontent. And you begin to cry out and say, I'm discontent. See, if everything was going all right, we generally don't cry out as much. When, things, when we're discontent, we begin to cry out. And there's tension in that transition. There's a transformational change is the outcome of tension. So we've been in a place of transition and tension. And it's out of that place of discontentment that actually birthed is transformational change. And a releasing comes forth. Out of this place of the wilderness, you know, what does the wilderness do or the barrenness do? It draws you together. So out of that relationship, there's birthed something. There's, out of that relationship is birthed a release in the presence of God. And just to close, you think, I think it's, you know, I've traveled around the world a little bit here, but, you know, one of our, I believe, if we're going to say what is our vision and mission for this next season, I believe it has to flow out of the understanding of what Jesus' mission was in the gospel, what he revealed through his life and what he did. Jesus led out a relationship with the Father and it was rooted in God's love. And if I was to say, what is the mission or the vision of this church? It's actually the same as Jesus. But I want to read one scripture that I really believe is at the core of who we are as a group of believers. And it's in Matthew. I keep coming back to this. Because when I start to define who we are as a people, this is the only thing that I can grab hold of, that I know that Jesus, he actually said it. And this is what we should be. And he said in Matthew 21, verse 13, My house should be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. He said a house of prayer, a house of worship, a house of intercession. That's who we are. And then he goes on, verse 14, The blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. And the two go together. And so it's time, yes, we've been praying and interceding and the worship has gone forth, but now it's also time to see the blind healed, the lame walking, to see people healed, to cry out and say, God, we are at the point of total discontent, but we want to also see that birthing come through. It actually says down the bottom, out of the mouth of infants and nursing babes, you have prepared praise. You know what I'm re- I think he's really saying there? Out of those that have sin- sincere hearts that are innocent, that just can't do it. We're not clever enough to do it. We're not. It's out of that sense of inadequacy, out of that childlikeness that he can come and actually release that sense of healing. In this verse, I see our way forward. Transformation comes by following Christ through the Spirit, through the Holy Spirit with with a group of believers, with others. It's sort of like we've got to die to ourselves, our infatuation with speed and size, and devote ourselves, devote ourselves to the work of making disciples and training the few. It's about being intentional. And this year is to see the vision in the sense, in the form, in the womb, to actually see it be birthed at the right time. It's also the year to see the wineskin fully formed so that the new wine can be poured out. See, God brings us out of the confines and limitations of a place called barrenness so that the new wine can be poured out. And the enemy has attempted to, to abort, steal, delay the destinies of, in this b- group of believers. And I believe the anointing is about to open up in such a way that the presence, the glory and the power of God are going to be imparted to us in a revelatory way. But not only that, that we will see healings, we'll see the miraculous uh, happen. And, you know, I actually say to God, how do you do this practically? And I think incorporating prayer and worship and intercession as part of our Sunday as well, being very intentional. It was interesting. I was starting, starting to think about it during the week, or two weeks ago, actually. I said, God, how can we do this? You know, this is what the call is upon the church. And you know, so, you know, what, are, what does the movement mean? You know, you've got all these questions in your head. Well, I do. And, and then we got a, an email from the people who own, run, have, have this building uh, that we rent off. You, you think, oh no, we've got to move again. No, it's all right. But one of the things they said is that, you know, they want to take back those back two spaces up there. We won't be able to use them anymore. We only be able to use this. And you think, oh, what are we going to do, God? You know? And then it sort of all dovetailed into the fact that God has called us as a church to prayer, intercession, worship. And this is a call upon us, this is a mandate, and to see the miraculous happen. And so that will mean that basically that prayer will happen in this room as well. 
and that it will be a springboard into worship. And so God is actually paving the way, even though we're not, even we're hesitant to make the decisions, he actually does it as well. Because you could see that as a negative, but I see it as a positive as well. So it'll be a time where we will see things begin to shift in the supernatural realm. I believe this year that we'll start prayer hub, hubs and to see the breakthrough in the supernatural and to keep saying to ourselves, what is in our hands? I just, you know, every time I, I ask the Lord, what are you doing? You know, when, you, when you're a leader in a church, you, things can hit you from all different sides. And one of the questions I'll say, God, what are you doing? <laughs> what are you doing? And then he says, just look at, look what's in your hand and what is in my hand is the only thing that I know to do and it is to pray to worship to intercede and to fit, fix my focus on him and to fix my focus on the fact that he is about to birth something this year that this is a year of birthing um, and that symbolizes that sense that God is going to bring forth the fruitfulness at this time in Jesus name we're just going to close Jen, if you can get up. And I'd just like us to pray uh, to finish up. And I'd like to actually blow, blow, blow the shofar. You know that I think it, because uh, the New Year's on the Sabbath today, they actually don't do it, but they, sp they blow it a hundred times. Imagine you, you get a bit of sore lips with all that. But um, I just think it was so significant because I started to feel that September is where we should really believe. Now you think, you know, we are not haven't got whole all these fantastic preachers up here. But you know, when you get in those communion circles, that's where God meets. That's where his presence comes. That's where you lay your hands on others, other believers and say, God, I want to see this happen. You know why it's so beautiful? Rather than you having this massive long altar call and me putting my hand on you and pushing you over. It's <laughs> you know what I'm saying. It's all praying for you. It's more that it's the believers are alongside you and part of you and, and it's the, the, the priesthood of believers coming forth, a royal priesthood coming forth. And this morning, let's just lift our voices. I, I know we've already done it, but just near the end here. And if you want to stay back, we've got some food on up the back. Come and fellowship with us. Come and talk to each other and say, Lord, I'm believing for this this year. I'm going to sense to see the release of your presence in a new way and in a new dynamic. And, you know, one of the things that what happens is often with this is that we want things to move very quickly but a large cruise ship it is imperceivable in the way that it moves and i believe god is saying just move ever so gently just keep stepping one step at a time and i'll show you the way to go but to keep your focus on the fact that god is about to birth something in our presence in jesus name amen Yes, Lord, we thank you today that victory is, our, is ours in Jesus' name. Lord, and we declare victory over, over this, this new year. Lord, the victory, Father, of, of, of this day, Lord, of Rosh Hashanah as we step into the victory. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. We're just going to do, we're going to play, um, play the... Shofar. Has anybody ever tried to play a shofar or blow one? I can't get any noise. It sounds like a cow dying when I do it. <laughs> yep. This is fine.
Amen. I want you to go and grab a hand of someone right across the church this morning. I'm just going to close with a word of prayer. Come on, grab someone's hand. Someone's hand. Don't let anybody stand in without holding on to someone. Father God, you promised, Lord, that you would build your church and the gates of hell would not prevail. And Lord, we thank you this morning that we as a people are entering into this new season in with a with a victory declared over us, Lord, in Jesus' name. We thank you, Father, that the weapons that are formed against us shall not prosper. We thank you this morning that we would take back that which the enemy has stolen. And Lord, this morning we declare that we're going to enter. We're going to enter by, by faith in your word in Jesus' name. You know, um, a couple of weeks ago, about a week or so ago, I had a dream. And uh, you know when you get a dream from the Lord, it sort of sticks around, it hangs around. And there's a lot going on in this dream. But, but I walked into this room and Dorothy was there. And, and there's a bunch of people, but Dorothy... I said something to Dorothy and I said, oh, it's about faith. And she, she looked at me and she said, everything's by faith. But as, as she said that, I woke up and I knew it was the Lord saying to me, everything you do is by faith. And the season we've been in, friends, is a season where God is saying, hey, this is taking what I've promised by faith. You may not see it through your natural eyes yet, but as you take it by faith and step into it, the promise will be yours. And so this morning, I want to encourage you, wherever you are personally, whatever's going on in your journey, you know, take it by faith. Step in and say, it's mine through, through the blood of the Lamb. Amen. Why don't you give someone a high five or a hug or, a, or a something this morning? This is how I fight my battle. This is how I fight my battle. This is how I fight my battle.